previously on X-Men. The podcast that looks back on X-Men comics, movies, shows, characters, and more. And more this time means... An interview. An interview. A little bit of a spoiler there. An ex-spoiler. <laughs> you can find more about this show and other like it. spoil the episode that's happening right now. I guess. I, I guess I wanted to surprise him. Okay. At the end of all this. Pretend I Pret- didn't say that. Yes. Psychic, use your psychic powers that we learned you had. <laughs> My Mentor psychic Magneto. powers. To make them forget. Uh, that's something Xavier in the comics would do. He would 100% yeah. do without hesitation. Yeah. He would open his Christmas presents, get caught, <laughs> mind wipe them, and then pretend like it was the first time on Christmas morning. I would 100% believe that is canon. <laughs> this seems familiar. <laughs> uh, you can find more about this show and others like it at our network's website, radiomeanwhile.com. Other shows on the network include Three Nice Things, where we force ourselves to say three nice things about a movie with a bad and often earned reputation. There's Is It Classic, Does It Rock, where we pick a band or artist and go through their discography album by album, track by track. And 9021, here we go, a 90210 rewatch podcast. Share your thoughts on this and upcoming episodes by following us on Facebook and Twitter at Previously on X. And please rate, subscribe, and share the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. I'm Eric Mickles, known online as Dust vs. Tweak, and with me is my co-host, Hillary Gunning. That is me. And today we have an exclusive interview. Can, can we say that? That's right, I right? I never know what, when they say exclusive, mm-hmm. I never really know what the criteria are for Because that. you didn't call it a press conference. So it's it wasn't just us, us with a bunch of other X Men podcasts with our microphones yeah, at Steve Englehart. It was Englehart exclusive. Being like, Mr. Englehart, Mr. Englehart. <laughs> uh, so, yes, this was an exclusive interview with Steve Englehart, a uh, comic book legend who, as Hillary pointed out uh, in the interview, at a time, he was the, he was the only game in town. If you yep. wanted new X Men adventures, you had to get them in other books because they didn't have their own book anymore. Mm-hmm. So we talked to him about his time writing Beast yep. as a solo character in his... Amazing Adventures. Yep. We talk about him uh, bringing Beast over to the Avengers. We talk about his time just writing the X Men mm-hmm. and you know where that came from. If it was uh, his choice or if it was mandated, he. I mean, he has them in his Captain America Secret Society story, which is a big deal. Yeah. And I, I was wondering why he had the X-Men in there at all. So it was It was fun. Gave a really uh, fun interview. So now Here it is. we'll play that. So uh, I would like to talk a little bit about your Beast run in Amazing Adventures for a bit. Sure. Uh, could you give us a little context for what was happening at the time? You were the only game in town for X-Men right then, right? Right. Well, the X-Men had failed. I mean, the X-Men, I always thought, I back it up, this is, this is just my thing, but the X-Men and the Avengers debuted at the same month, and they were both bi-monthly for a while, and then the Avengers became monthly, but the X-Men didn't for a, for a much longer period. And I think it cemented X-Men in people's brains as being a second-level book. Sure. And so, you know, at the end of their initial run, it was Roy Thomas and Neil Adams doing this book. Jim Steranko had worked on this book, and nothing could make it sell. So it, you know, it had gone to the great comic book graveyard in the in the sky. And then Roy, as the new editor, thought, well, you know, Marvel's doing okay with like Frankenstein and Werewolf and Dracula books. So maybe if we took the Beast and made him more of a werewolf kind of character. Oh. Um, we could, you know, maybe we could make that sell. And so Roy and Jerry Conway did the first issue, and then they gave me my first superhero title. Uh, and so I took over the second issue of Amazing Adventures, and, and that's, you know, everything started there for me. I was doing The Beast, and once again, I'm looking to fill out the world, to, you know, to, to, to give him more relationships and more and more people around him and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the people around him were obviously the X-Men. And the thing about Marvel is if you're, if you're the fantastic four writer, then you're in charge of Dr. Doom as well. You know I mean? If somebody wants to use Dr. Doom, they have to come to you. Right. But if you're, but if there's nobody writing the X-Men, then they're just there for anybody to use. (laughs) And And I was the, you know, I was the young guy and I had no, I, you know, the Beast had no nobody else associated with him, so I started using the X-Men. And then they continued not to be a book, and so I used them in Captain America, and I used them, you know, all these different places. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me now when I think back on it. I'm going to jump ahead. The Beast series eventually ended. I wrote the Avengers a couple years later. In the Avengers, I was revamping the, te- the team. I said, I like the Beast. He was my firstborn, so I'm going to put him in the Avengers. All that took place before the new X-Men, right? I mean, uh-huh. before Claremont and Byrne came along, and, or 
Ween and 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 uh, Cochram. Yeah, it's amazing to me that that book was out of business for that long. Sure, but it was, and and so if anybody could have used the X Men, and I think other people did. But basically, I you know I kind of said, well, that's one of the few cards I have in my in my pocket here, so I I'll use the X Men when I get a chance, you know. That's funny because I was I was surprised to see them in the solo Beast as much as I did. I sort of assumed that if X Men wasn't really selling, then Beast would just sort of be a solo guy hanging out on his own. But they kept popping up, and I was always surprised to see them there. So was was that it then? Beast Beast was chosen out of the five X Men and the in, the mutants that had been introduced because of the the monster kind of vibe. Yep, and that's why when he you know he started out as gray and right. and and the sales. The sales, you know, it's my first book, and uh, oh. fortunately it wasn't my last. But, I mean, you know, <laughs> sales did not go through the roof, so then they made him darker to make him scarier. I mean, okay. all that stuff was, was an attempt to try to figure out what, you know, because Marvel still owned the character. But, I mean, right. what what do we do in order to make him sell? That was an assigned job to you then, getting the beast? Every, well, every, everything was. Okay. I mean, I, we, we talked earlier about my being – invited over to DC and, and told, you know, told I could do whatever I needed to do. Right. But in those days, everything was with those few exceptions, it was mm-hmm. assigned. I mean, you didn't, you didn't get your buddy and go in there and say, Hey, we'd like to do the beast. Right. They would just come to you and say, you want to write the beast? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and your artist is going to be this other guy. And it's like, okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> I always say, you know, people, you know, when you get your first job, you don't go, yeah, I'd like to renegotiate that. <laughs> right, sure. So you go, no, what are the rules? What am I supposed to right. do? In my case, one of the rules was you can have complete creative freedom, which was unbelievable. Yeah, sure. But others were, you know, yeah, you're just you're just going to do whatever we assign. Mm-hmm. I mean, they would come and they'd say, okay, now you're writing the beast. Do you want to write Captain America? Yeah, I do. Okay, well, then you can write Captain America. You know, it's like wow. they didn't just say you will write it. You didn't go to them and say, I want right. to do something. They came right. to you. So the first issue of Beast uh, having his own series, it, it wasn't written by you. It, it was where uh, Beast transforms. So now that he's, you know, furry and uh, right. monster-like, uh, did you know that was going to happen when you were assigned the job? Or did you find oh, out yeah. that? Oh, so you had that plan then going in. This wasn't a surprise that Beast is now furry. No, no, I, I didn't plan it. They, I mean, Roy and Jerry planned it. But, I mean, they, they, did, they came up with what they thought was a good first issue right. for the whole thing. And then they said, here, now it's yours, you know. So I just took it, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, comic book writing is somebody else has been writing this book and now it's yours. So now what are you going to do with it? You know, and that's that again is just part of the job. So you knew you knew you were going to have this furry beast. It seems like you really took the idea of his transformation and ran with it in those issues um, with his internal struggle a lot more than it was very forceful the way you did that. Do you want to talk about that a little? Well, it's just it's just. Just the way I write, I you know I want to get inside each one of these characters, and and so I'm thinking. I, I mentioned earlier uh, when I took over Captain America, I said, okay, if I were Captain America, what would I do? But uh, you know, I hadn't formulated it earlier when I did the Beast, but it was the same thing. It's like, okay, I wanted the Beast. He had always been the brainy one, right? And you could tell because he talked in big words. And I, you know, this was the '70s, so I was thinking, and it was pretty clear he was he was intelligent, but he was but he was funny too. I mean, he, you know, I gave him the, the sense of humor really that cause he was smart enough to, to be able to, to kind of look at things from a sideways perspective. And, and, you know, that's, again, I'm just building up this character in my head. Who is this guy? I mean, I, you know, up to that point, he'd been defined by other people. So I always thought it was incumbent upon me to, to believe what other people had said. You know, I, I was not one of those guys who would come in and go, well, I'm here now, so everything is different. Right. Oh, no, this is the guy that you know, but but now that he's in a different situation, he's going to react differently. He's going to grow from the from the problems, you know, whatever. And, and so, yes, I was interested in the internal person. And again, the whole thing about putting on a rubber suit so that you could look like a human being, a yeah. little bit, a little bit dubious in terms of real life, but so I didn't want to like spend a lot of, you know, I didn't want to have to do that any more than I had to. I mean, it was useful, obviously, how else you're going to interact with people. But see, I like the X-Men. I mean, it was amazing to me that that book failed. And, and you know, over the years when I've talked about this and I tell people, yeah, the X-Men when was canceled. People, you know, there are a lot of people who don't know that and can't imagine it, you know. But uh, I had liked those guys. 
and so like about him the camaraderie the you know the the sense of the now it's a cliche but i mean you know the outsiders versus the the world that hates them you know i mean Mm -hmm. Uh, people have spent a lot of capital building that up over the years, but but I always thought this this small group of unknown people who you know with their cool you know their cool Professor X and his you know mansion and and all I mean it was a good setup for for stuff and and uh, you know I I saw them as a group I uh, probably Jean Grey was my favorite you know if I had to pick amongst the original X Men oh yeah but you know but I like but I liked um, the Beast you know I mean. And, I would say the Iceman never did much for me, you know, and I, Beast was fine, you know, and so, and they, you know, they put him in a good situation. And so I had a lot to play with. And, 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 um, again, as I say, the sales, sales did not pick up and the, I don't, my run only lasted five or six issues. Right. But, but Roy obviously saw enough in what I was trying to do to not fire me. And, you know, so. <laughs> You mentioned that the Beast as a werewolf character because of the monster books, and I kind of found that your Beast run has kind of a tone that is more in line with something like Tomb of Dracula or Werewolf by Night at the time. And yeah. That was also a kind of a vibe that I felt was going on in your Batman run, this kind of uh, this eerie, uh, fog-covered storytelling. Is that something that you enjoy, or is it something that's in the air at the time with comic books? No, it's something I enjoy. Okay. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I am a pulp fan. I, you know, back in the '60s and '70s, you know, they they republished all the Doc Savages and all the Shadows as paperbacks, coming out monthly. I mean, so in addition to reading comics in that time period, I was reading all this pulp stuff, and you know, pulp stuff can get um, tedious after a while, and and you know, it's it's a precursor to comics, so there right. are things that. But still, it had a it had a wonderful atmosphere. I mean, they had done in the 30s and 40s. They had done all this dark and spooky stuff, um, which is where Batman came from in the first place, right? Right. So um, uh, I liked that. But I, you know, I think I like. I mean, I like flying through outer space with Green Lantern too. You know, I mean, I like figuring out escape plans for Mr. Miracle. I mean, it's mm-hmm. all, I just like comics, you know, but all that stuff is part of comics as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Well, before we move on from uh, your beast run too far, I wanted to to pick up on what you were talking about earlier with the, uh, the female characters and how you yeah. kind of actively tried to, to make them more like actual people. Give them agency. Give them agency. Yeah. yeah. And uh, something I noticed in your beast was the almost comical, stuff with uh captain baxter and his wife pat and you would have him yeah. basically tell her to sit down and shut up and i wondered if that was like a like a specific send up of the old style of dealing with women or if that was just sort of a dribble over from how it used she's to the one be figuring stuff out yeah no but well again in the beast i had no other characters to play with uh, now, you know i had the x-men now mm-hmm. but i mean i didn't have any others so i brought patsy walker in Patsy had been a romance heroine, right? I mean, I, I don't know what you know about Patsy no, Walker, I didn't but I mean know that. That's interesting. No, Patsy Walker goes back to the forties. She had been the star of a girls magazine, right? And uh-huh. she had her best friend Hetty. And then there was Patsy Walker, there was Hetty Wolf, and then there was Patsy and Hetty as a group. I mean, that was a successful run for a long time. And it was, you know, sort of comic adventures of you know, girls Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then uh, in the 60s, as the whole Marvel thing started up, Stan shifted him over and it became a soap opera. And so, you know, there was an ongoing story running through it and there was heartbreak and there was, you know, all this good stuff. And then those books all went away. In Fantastic Four annual number four, I want to say, whenever Reed and Sue got married, Reed and Sue come out of the out of the church, and the entire Marvel universe is standing outside, you know, to congratulate them. And in the crowd was Patsy and Hetty, oh, wow. which was, which was Stan's, you know, Stan sort of nodding mm-hmm. to them, yeah. right? But they, but so here I am going, what can I do in the Marvel universe? And I go, Patsy Walker had appeared in the Marvel universe, wow. and so and so. That's what. That's how she got into my book. Um, I needed more stuff. You know, the Beast had the X Men, and he had Linda Donaldson, who was a spy, who was his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. 
that, that was it, you know, and I needed to expand beyond that. So I brought in Patsy Walker and, and Buzz, who was her boyfriend from the old, from the old soap opera days and probably even before that. But in the soap opera, it had been, it was the, if I may say, girls' reality of the 60s, uh -huh. which was, you know, he told her to, I mean, he didn't usually tell her to sit down and shut up, but um, <laughs> he was, you know, he was the guy and she was the girl and that was, you know, that was the deal. Mm -hmm. And what I was exploring, what I was starting to explore there was she was outgrowing that, you know, she, she was... You know, he was her boyfriend, and then you know that's all good. But it's like she was getting a little annoyed at, yeah. at he was treating her, and and so the whole, you know, so all that leads into the fact where she she helps the beast out, mm -hmm. and she says, "I'll do this if you'll do something for me." And then the book got, the book got canceled, and we never found out what it was. Yeah, I was curious. Oh, but she, <laughs> but she was taking she was taking control of her destiny at that. I mean, it's like right, yeah. you got to do something for me. So then later, when I put the beast in the Avengers, I brought her back because I wanted to know what he had promised her, right? right? And what he had promised her was that he would help her become a superheroine because oh, she wanted cool. to get into that world, right? And so that's how the Hellcat came to be right, later yeah. on, right? So it was, you know, from the start, yeah, I mean, even, I mean, Patsy Walker was the typical good girl. Uh -huh. and, and and from the start, I guess, you know, I said she should be more than that, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, really, I, I I look back at this and talk about it now, and it sounds like, wow, what a what a enlightened, woke guy you were, you know? <laughs> it's but true. It, seemed, <laughs> it just seemed logical to me, you know? It's just like, yeah. why would I want a character who couldn't do anything, you know? Such I want an interesting, to do things. There's such an inter interesting choice for you to make to bring in all, a character that was already established rather than just creating a new one. And then also <laughs> to give that much development to a side character. And, like, you had plans for the future of, like, her growth as a person. <laughs> I think that's yeah. a really interesting thing to to have happen. Well, I, you know, if I were Patsy Walker, what would I do? You know, that's just, uh, that's, I'm just looking, where can they all go? Who are they? What can they become? You know, they're humans. Yep. You, you've, you've been writing the beast. Then you're writing the Avengers. What, what is it really about this one character beast that made you want to just bring him into the Avengers proper, you know, versus any of the other X-Men? I mean, he had a solo series, but you, if you're writing the X-Men in general, you might've had your pick of the litter. Was it what what was it about Beast that you're like he should also be an Avenger for you? Well, he's my firstborn, you know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, as it out, out of total happenstance, they said, mm -hmm. "Would you like to write the Beast?" And I go, "Sure, I'd, I, you know, I'll write anybody." And so mm -hmm. I, you know, I invested time and energy into the Beast and and tried to make him somebody that I would like and you would like and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So, um, and I didn't do that with the others, really, you know. Mm -hmm. So. I had complete freedom, and so when I was doing the Avengers and revamping the group, I thought, you know, we didn't finish that story. We, right. you know, I I can finish that story here, mm -hmm. and it's funny to me now. I mean, again, a lot of people tell me they think Beast is an Avenger more than an X Men. You know, yeah, he spent and, a lot of time with them before he ever yeah. came back. Yeah, you know, mission accomplished, I guess. <laughs> you know, but I just. He just, you know, he's my firstborn. So I have a, I have a, a special place in my heart for the beast. It, it does seem like you tend to really want to uh, tie up loose ends or uh, continue stories that may have started in another book, but then maybe that book was... Is that something that was just a personal thing for you? Like, I can't leave this storyline unfinished? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I Yes, I liked Marvel continuity. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was a shock to me, at, you know... 20 years later when people started going, oh, do I really have to buy this other book in order to know what happened in this? You know, it's mm -hmm. like, and, and it, I had to recalibrate my brain and go, mm -hmm. okay, now it's been 30 years. And, and so you can't very well say, you know, go look at this book, you know, and, and we all know that this happened in 1964 right. and stuff like that. You know, now it's been 60 years, you know, or 80 years or whatever the heck it's been. Right. Uh, so, yeah, that had to go away, but I really liked it. I thought, you know, that really added to the reality of the whole thing. I mean, mm -hmm. and, you know, when Stan was doing it by himself in the beginning, it was easy enough to do because it was all in his brain. So he knew all the connections. And, and I just thought it was cool that, that this guy had met this guy. And, and so 
mm-hmm. some, you know, as I said, these things happen. So what do they mean? You know, I take it as face value. Yeah. Well, it seems like such a special thing to be able to do. Like if a, if a book of yours is canceled or they move on in a different direction and then you, you still have the opportunity to flesh that out. A lot of people in other mediums, I think, wouldn't have that chance. They're done. It's over. But you can just take right. it over to somewhere else. Right. Well, comic book characters never die, right? I mean, you, you know, you, you can shoot them, you can electrocute them, you can do whatever, but copyright will indicate that you better, you know, republish them at some point or you'll lose it. So that's why they keep doing Hawkman. You know? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, OK, it didn't work the last 14 times, but but you got to do one. So let's try this. So they're all there. And, and it is a periodical medium. So we're all everybody who's doing it is, is, you know, doing a story a week or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, I might just say as a total sidebar, I sometimes would get up to five books a month and I would think that would be, that's kind of tough to kind of do five books. I was happy doing four. I looked it up just before Stan hired Denny O'Neill and, and Roy Thomas as his assistants. Stan was doing 13 a month. 13 a month? <laughs> And that ranged from Patsy Walker to the Fantastic Four, right? Holy cow. I mean, Stan was Stan. Stan was everything that he was said to be, right? Wow. I mean, he was he was a great he he lived it. He lived it. And and um, I could you know I could never do thirteen books. I couldn't. Yeah. You know. sure. Anyway, so yeah, you know I I I could circle back a couple years later and go yeah let's finish off that story. In that case, I'm just sort of finishing off the continuity of my own stories, right. but same thing. So it kind of seems then like when you're writing the Avengers and the X-Men are canceled and Beast doesn't have his own uh, book maybe at the time, the Avenger uh, Magneto shows up and causes trouble for the X-Men and the X-Men are there. It it kind of sounds like then maybe that isn't like a, the Marvel isn't putting out this edict like, hey, somebody needs to write the X-Men, put the X-Men in the Avengers this month or something. It seems like maybe that was something you wanted to do then. Yeah, no, it was all me. There, there, there were no edicts. I mean, that right. was the thing. We were just told, you know, when I got my books, they said, if you can turn this in on time every month and make it sell, you can keep doing it. And if you can't do that, then we'll fire you and we'll get somebody else who can. That was, you know, I mean, they did not, I mean, Stan might have been able to write 13 books, but Roy was not interested in editing 30 books or whatever it was at that point. So he just said, you know, each one of you guys is responsible for your own books. And I mean, he was the ultimate editor, but I don't recall really him changing anything or doing stuff. I mean, so long, I mean, that was the, uh, the selling part was, and, and, and making your deadlines. I mean, those are both important, but I mean, if you were doing that, then case closed, they didn't, you know, if, if, if you wanted to have Captain America get involved with the Watergate thing, does it sell? Okay. Then you can do that. You know, I mean, they, there was nobody going, you can't do politics, you can't do this, you can't do that. It was just, do people want to read this stuff? Okay, then good, you know? Well, so, in that case, thanks for keeping the X-Men going during that period. Well, yeah, I mean, I just liked them. And, and I mean, they, they were useful to me, but, I mean, I did like them. And and um, I, I, that's another thing that, that I only figured out in retrospect, that I was the X-Men writer during that type sure. period. I guess my question, the, the, my my last question really is that your Captain America and the Falcon storyline, where you're talking about Watergate, your Secret Empire storyline, that was obviously like a big and uh, it seemed like a very personal, important story for you uh, yeah. to comment on Captain America's place in the world now and you know the state of America at the time. The X Men are in there, and it's not just like a cameo; they don't just show up for an issue and then disappear. They stay in there for you know the duration of the storyline when they show up, and they're they're a pretty big part of the story and uh, the plans in there. It sounds like, you know, you've, you've said Marvel didn't tell you to put the X-Men in there. So I guess bringing the X-Men in there, was that always your plan then? Or it, yeah, it, it, well, just I mean, seemed, it, it seemed unique to me for that type of story. Well, my basic plan was to do the Watergate thing. We thought that that was a one of a kind kind of deal for America and, <laughs> and that it was a big a big thing and we hoped we'd get through it and then we would never have to face anything like that again. So, and I'm writing Captain America. I mean, there, mm-hmm. so, you know, if I were Captain America, would I ignore all that? No, right. I don't think I would, you know? So I, I wanted to do a Watergate story when I started to put it together, the X-Men fit into it. And so there they were, it, it was all again, just me thinking this seems like it makes a story. It seems okay. like it fits together just right. By that time, I was, you know, I mean, 
it basically, I still didn't think of myself as the X-Men writer, but I mean, I definitely was sort of like, they're right there for me whenever I want them, you know, so. Yeah. Well, I'm interested I like now with the way that you're talking about uh, how stories develop and how you end up bringing in characters. So do you have like a pool of characters that you just sort of pick from when you have a story you want to tell? Or how do you how do you end up finding who's going to fit right? Well, yeah, I mean, um, basically, you know, if you're writing the Avengers, then Kang the Conqueror is your guy. And so you can use Kang the Conqueror whenever you want to. And oh. and, and and the rest in of that each- realm. Yeah, people who are, you know, if they're Avengers, if they're in the Avengers realm, then the Avengers writer has them. If you're the Fantastic Four writer, you've got those guys, okay. you know, whatever. But then, you know, if you if you if you are the Avengers writer and you want to put Doctor Doom in the thing, mm-hmm. you would just go to the to the Fantastic Four writer and say, I got this idea for Doctor Doom. How do we work this out? And mm-hmm. every time, I mean, it was part of the part of the gestalt there. People would go. The, the FF writer would go, yeah, okay, sure. I mean, he might, you might run into somebody going, well, I've got Dr. Doom trapped on Pluto for the next three months. It's like, <laughs> so then, <Around> that. <laughs> so you can't, you can't, you know, you can't do it for, I mean, there might be some logistical thing, but, but the general, I mean, the invariable response was sure, we'll work this out, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so basically everybody in the Marvel universe was yours, but you know, you couldn't be writing the Avengers and stock it with fantastic four villains all the time. Right. Cause that right. would, you know, the fantastic four, what are they going to do then? You know? So mm-hmm. on big established books like that, you had a whole group of people. I mean, the, with the, I could reel them off, but I mean, you know, you books that are large and have been around for a long time have got all their supporting cast and, 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 villains that belong to them and so on and so forth um the v the beast was a particular instance of not having any of that stuff mm-hmm. really so it was a different situation but yeah you you know once you become the green lantern writer then sinestro is yours you know i mean it's like that's just how that works well thanks so much for talking with us it's been a really interesting conversation well you're welcome i i hope somebody comes in and listens to it at some point that'd be nice wouldn't it <laughs> Yeah. To echo uh, Hillary's uh, thanks, thanks for you know keeping the lights on for the X Men and you know bringing them into these bigger storylines when they weren't the things that were going to sell. You know, it's not like the '90s where you put the X Men in a book to boost sales. You right. brought them into Captain America because you like the X Men. So uh, we appreciate that here. Good. Well, I, you know, that was my point to try to, to give you guys something that you would enjoy. What a fun interview. It was a really fun interview. I really <laughs> yeah. enjoyed it. Uh, he, I got a little choked up uh, when he was talking about Stan because he was getting a little choked up, it seemed like, talking about how Stan, Stan was everything you wanted him to be and everything. Because, I mean, for him, Stan would have been his, like, boss. Yeah. He, you know, the guy he was looking up to and everything. And, you know, that's a big deal. If you'd like to hear him talk about Batman and his time writing for DC Comics, go over to the All the Books show, where we have mm-hmm. an exclusive interview with him over there. Me yeah. and Nick interviewed him about his time writing Batman. Nick talked to him about the Green Lantern and other characters, and uh, his, his intention with writing those characters as well, and why yeah. he, he made the switch. He was uh, super generous with his time. Yeah. There's lots of really interesting stuff yeah. in there. Yeah, I had a great time talking about the because it is such a weird, nebulous time for the X-Men. Mm-hmm. And uh, fun. it's just nice to... You got some he, good insights. He just liked the X-Men. Yeah. And I like that. Isn't it nice so. when people... And he, he that said... We you like the X-Men? He said <laughs> he was writing those stories so that you and I yeah. would enjoy reading those stories. Which I was like, just bless Thank his you. heart. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was our interview. I'm Dust vs. Tweak everywhere online and apart from other shows on Radio Mean Oil Network, I'm the co-host of the podcast, The All the Book Show. Thank you to Prophetic Music for our theme song. Again, you can find more about this show and others like it at the network's website, radiomeanwhile.com. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Previous on X. Please rate, subscribe, and share the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. If you're looking for another interview we did, we interviewed uh, Fred Van Lenty mm-hmm. about his time writing X-Men Noir. Yep, earlier episode. And the, Wolverine uh, first, first Class. class. <laughs> Wolverine First Class. And then we'll see you next episode. Thanks for listening. Yeah.